Hey there, how is it going? So this is going to be a very interesting video and you know, at this point in time, I have no clue what the outcome will be, but that's the whole purpose is we're gonna find out. So what am I talking about? So last week I made this short little video. Okay, so here's a question for all the engineers out there. Tell me why that we do all this work, all this R&D, millions of dollars developing these high energy, high density coil packs, spark plugs, all that stuff, just to use a spring to transfer the energy from the coil to the plug. Can someone explain that to me, please? <laughs> and since then, I've had a lot of people say a lot of different things and none of them not one has actually gave me a really good reason to why there is a spring in the coil packs of this car or any car really so okay i guess maybe to some extent the it works response is sufficient maybe for your everyday vehicle but what happens when you have it on a vehicle like this a performance vehicle with a performance tuned engine with modifications pushing things past its normal range of operation is the spring still sufficient it's crazy to think that all the other high energy ignition systems that i've had to mess with over the years i've had to spend a lot of money in you know thick wire yeah i get the spark plug wire but just to give you an example thick shielded wire like this just so i can transfer the energy efficiently and with as little resistance as possible so as much energy gets from the coil to the spark plug while i get it you know these are coil on plugs they have very short distance to travel even then i still feel like using a spring is not the best method i couldn't let that slip my mind i had to dig deep and find out whether having a spring is really a good idea or not well that's what this video is all about we're going to find out let's have some fun on cars create so here i have the coil from my car of course you have your boot and then inside the boot, the only thing inside the boot is this little spring. This is the only thing touching the piece of metal inside the coil and the spark plug. This is it. Now, yeah, I get it. It's metal. It conducts electricity, but it's just this tiny little thing that spirals, which means if you extend it out, it's really long. It's going to probably be like this long or something when you stand it all out, the electricity has to go through all of that to get to the spark plug. Okay, so in understanding how electronics work, when electricity goes through a coil, it creates a magnetic field. So I had to wonder if energy is coming from this and going through this is creating a magnetic field. If that is really what's happening, while I'm saying I have no really way of testing this, nor am I an expert on it, but that's just my theory and me analyzing this with the information that I know. So then really the important question I had to ask myself is, how much resistance does this create? because there isn't really much here. It's just a spring. So of course we have an easy way of testing it with our handy dandy cheapo Harbor Freight multimeter. I get it, this is not the most accurate tool for measurement, but it displays numbers and that's what we're gonna work with. Okie dokie, so let's turn our bad boy on here. I'm gonna touch the probes together. That's gonna give us a baseline reading and our baseline which means as far as the meter is concerned, no resistance. This is only the resistance going through the probes. So that is 0.6 ohms. That's really low resistance. Okay, cool. Now that we got that out of the way, let's see how much our spring has, how much resistance it has or doesn't have. Let's see here, how much resistance does this have? Holy crap. So this does create a little bit of resistance, 1.8. So one, almost two ohms of resistance this spring creates. That's not good, right? If we want maximum transfer of energy, we want as least resistance as possible. And this is exactly what I had feared. So now I'm like, hmm, man, what can I create to test this that has less resistance and is still gonna work within 
<laughs> this. So that's where I went to the hardware store and got some of this. This is solid copper grounding wire. You see putting electrical systems in your home and you're putting the, the earthing ground wire into the ground. This is generally what it is, just thick copper. I'm pretty sure this is oxygen free copper too. So that's the better kind of copper you want. What I have done is I have made these. So these are just tiny little strips of that copper that are going to sit inside of the spring. See, they go in the spring just like so, sit in there just like that. And then when it's all back together, not only is the spring there, but now there is a solid form of connection between the coil and the plug. And copper is one of the best conductors we know of. So of course it's got to have less resistance, even though it's a solid core piece of copper, it's got to have less resistance, right? Well, let's check it. Let's get our baseline. 0.7. All right, now let's check this copper piece. Wow, look, there is no difference. That means there is no additional resistance created by this between the two probes. Unlike our spring here, which we'll just do back to back. Which is around two ohms of resistance. I have made the length of these copper pieces just the right length to when these push together, the spring actually collapses a little bit, compresses. So then it is actually solid metal to metal between coil and the spark plug. It has that solid piece of copper going straight through, touching both ends. Now at this point you're like finding dandy, Kirk. Now that you prove the spring is worse conductor, what does that really mean? That's the part of the video that I am curious about and we're about to find out. So of course, like I said, I've made four of those little inserts for every cylinder in the car. So what am I going to do is I'm going to take the car out. I'm going to use the dragging. I'm going to do my rolling time test. I'm going to do 40 to 80. I'm going to measure the time it takes both with those inserts in every cylinder and without. If there is a measurable difference, then we conclude that there is a benefit to having a better conductor between the coil and the plug. If there isn't a difference, then even though the spring offers more resistance, it isn't enough resistance to create a problem with power. So with that out of the way, we're gonna get in the car, we're gonna go out, do those tests, come back, switch it out, do it again. So there is minimal variables possible. In addition to timing the car with Draggy, I also want to get a data log because I want to see if there's actually any difference in the behavior of the ignition timing as the car is accelerating. If we can't see a difference with time, maybe the car is showing a difference with the ECU. So I'm going to do that as well so we can have more data to compare back to back. All right, obviously we're out here in the car. Pretty sure I got everything set up the way it needs to be. A little warm today. And uh, with that, I wanna emphasize on the fact that we're not focusing on how fast the number is in general, but we're focusing on the differences between the two numbers I get. But with that said, I'm not going to do any video while I'm taking the logs and recording the data because I wanna make sure I focus on uh, recording everything correctly. And uh, you know, sometimes it gets really hard to have to worry about a camera, worry about setting up the draggy, make sure the logs go and all that. So I'm just gonna go ahead and get the logs done and then we'll pick the video up after I do that and compare the data. So I'll see you in that part now. So now that all the data logging and everything is done, we're gonna go and take a look at what happened. And you know what? What I have found has actually surprised me but not in the way I thought it would. So let me go ahead and show you what I found. We're first gonna start with the draggy runs themselves. So we're gonna take a peek here. I haven't pulled up and here we go. So this run right here, this one is with the inserts. And as you can see, we have a total of 474 feet, 5.1 seconds it took to cover that distance and from 40 to 80. Take a look at the graph here. You can see kind of pulled up hard and stays nice and steady. It's pulling really good through here and it starts to level off, you know, the faster you go. And so far so good. Now let's come over here 
where we took the inserts out and it's just the springs and how the car is supposed to come from Ford. At this point in time, it's 89 degrees, but notice this right here, 122 feet. Why? It says I'm 20 feet less than it was. It was on the same section of road. So yeah, there's a discrepancy there. And it even says that the slope was more even. I would say this is actually more accurate because it, it seems to be a pretty flat section of road. Whereas this, it seems like it's a gradual dip. So I have a feeling this is just some of the inaccuracies you deal with with the device like the Draggy. But either way, this is the information I have to work with. But now moving on from that, because I wanted to point that out, this should be more favorable since the Draggy thinks it's at a lower elevation. But uh, as you can see here, 473 feet, 5.11 second. I mean, we're talking about two thousandths of a second difference. That is negligible. But the interesting is if you look on the graph, you can see kind of how it oscillates. Over here, the peaks are much higher, and this is the run with the inserts. It doesn't oscillate as much as it does without the inserts. So of course, with that information out of the way, then you gotta say, well, I mean, it doesn't seem like it makes a difference. And while the Draggy didn't seem to report such a difference, the data log on the other hand had a whole different story. And this is what shocked me. So we're gonna look at the run without the inserts. So let me take away everything that isn't important. So now that we've got everything up, we're looking at this line right here. This line is the knock sensor. And what we're looking at here is how it's stepping down. And basically at the beginning of the run, up here, it was pulling back almost a degree and a half of timing, and then it steps down or takes a little bit less away, 0.96, then goes back down to 0.46, and then it finally evens out. And then eventually, towards the end of the run, it adds half a degree of timing. What the timing is doing here isn't really necessarily something you wouldn't expect. You gotta think it's hot as hell today. I mean, it's like 90 degrees here in Florida, lots of hot air. So yeah, maybe a little bit spark corrections is not really a surprise until you look at the other data log. Let me pull that one up. Okay, so we're looking at the same thing here. We're looking at the knock sensor. This is with the copper inserts. This is a whole different story. And this is what really shocked me. So we start off the run up here. It's at zero and then it immediately starts adding timing. It adds half a degree here. And then right here, it ends up having, adding a whole degree of timing. And then it jumps back, 0.55, back up to 0.05, down to 0.55 again, then I end the run. So in every aspect of the run, it was adding timing. This is the same time of the day, the same section of road, the same pool at the same RPM, the same boost levels, even the intake temps were the same between both runs. The only difference is the run with the inserts, the car wanted to add timing instead of pulling it away. And I cannot understand why, but the car seemed to have favored, the ECU seemed to have favored the inserts being there rather than not being there, even though it didn't show on the draggy graph. Timing taken away versus timing added, we know that's adding power, adding all this timing versus taking it away. So that's just really interesting to me. Now, even though my data wasn't 100% conclusive, I think the data was good enough to continually pursue this. I definitely think there's something here that can be made better. How much better? I don't know. Honestly, without putting this thing on a dyno and doing back-to-back -back runs, it's gonna be so hard to tell if there really is a difference. And unfortunately, I just do not have access to a dyno. At least not to one I am willing to shell out money for just to make a video that I'm never going to get that money back. If you want to help me support that cause, you got to go ahead and give the video a thumbs up. It definitely helps. And with that, I think that's just going to end this video. Let me know what you think about what I found in today's video. Put them in the comments. Let's talk about them. It's going to wrap it up here for this video. If you like the video, please go ahead, give it a thumbs up, share with everyone you know. If you want to see more content like this and you haven't already, go ahead, subscribe to the channel. Keep a look out for next true car enthusiast video.